This is an election special. It consists of three parts. First, I'll present a short history of critical election theory. Second, I outline the function of liberal elections today. And then I conclude with some philosophical election advice for our American viewers, cautioning them not to fall prey to the pro-voting propaganda. Because as YouTube says, actually mostly of our viewers are from the US. Do not vote. Vote. No matter who you vote for, you have to vote. Vote, vote, vote. I will vote that cow. Come on. Let's start with election theory. In 1972, Jean Baudrillard published a short essay titled Requiem for the Media. The main point of this essay is that mass media are not a space for self-expression or for empowering people to initiate political change. To the contrary, Baudrillard suggests, the media are speech without response, a huge symbolic system drawing everyone into a common, inauthentic, non-responsive way of life. Baudrillard not only regards the technological media of the time, like TV or film, as media, but also democratic elections. Elections, too, are for him, like television, a type of integrated speech, leaving no room for play or reciprocal putting in play. He writes, the medium par excellence and the most beautiful of them all is the electoral system. Elections culminate in referendums, where the response is implied in the question itself as in the polls. They are the prime example of a speech that answers itself via the simulated detour of a response. Instead of engaging in real dialogue, voters make crosses on a ballot, all of which are exactly the same. Individual speech is abolished and replaced by a staged, prefabricated mass proclamation. No matter what its outcome, for Baudrillard, an election erases authentic expression. Everyone participates in a big impersonal speech act and melts into das Mann, as Heidegger would say, an anonymous mass. Baudrillard calls this the absolutization of speech under the formal guise of exchange. Five years earlier, in 1967, Guy Debord had already said as much in his book Society of the Spectacle. Whereas for Baudrillard, Liberal elections are an example of speech without response. De Boer saw them as examples of the spectacle, the staged show business that society as a whole has become under conditions of postmodern hypercapitalism. For De Boer, elections are a false choice offered by spectacular abundance. The political choice they offer is like the choice between fashion brands or between celebrities or influencers to follow or between sports teams to support. De Boer says, hence too, the never ending succession of paltry contests from competitive sports to elections that are utterly incapable of arousing any truly playful feelings. Like for Baudria, for De Boer too, elections show the inauthenticity of politics. In the spectacle of the election, voters are alienated from their real thoughts and feelings. Paradoxically, the election spectacle depoliticizes the people who take part in it and turns them into some sort of voting sheep who lack any real choices. The voters become part of a process that is never questioned. They resemble moviegoers in a multiplex cinema. They may watch different movies, but they all support the same spectacular industry. Most of Baudrillard's and de Boer's points echo what had already been said in clearer language and greater detail another five years earlier by another Frenchman who never became as fashionable as them, Jacques Ellul. In his book Propaganda, Ellul outlines how all modern societies are characterized and dominated by propaganda. He distinguishes between political propaganda and a more general sociological propaganda. Political propaganda exists in different forms. Authoritarian regimes like communist China or the Soviet Union at the time, but also liberal democracies in Europe or America, each use their own types. 
What Elul calls sociological propaganda is similar to Debord's spectacle and Baudrillard's speech without response. It is ideology in a wider sense, a sociopolitical structure, along with a set of values and narratives resulting in a common way of life. Here's a definition of sociological propaganda by Elul. The group of manifestations by which any society seeks to integrate the maximum number of individuals into itself, to unify its members' behavior according to a pattern, to spread its style of life abroad, and thus to impose itself on other groups. Sociological propaganda is not just about politics, but about all of society. It's in the media, in the culture industry, in academia, the law, and so on. Elul stresses that sociological propaganda, unlike political propaganda, is not made by anyone in particular. It can't be traced back to a certain group of people or organizations. Instead, it springs up spontaneously. It is not the result of deliberate propaganda action. So this is to say it's systemic, organic, or autopoetic, self-generating. That's essentially a Lumanian point of view. Elul suggests that elections must be understood in the context of both political and sociological propaganda. On the one hand, elections are contests between different political propaganda teams. But on the other hand, they serve a common sociological propaganda. Elul wrote propaganda in the early 60s. At this time, Political propaganda in liberal elections was still mostly confined to relatively short election campaigns that happened every four or five years or so. However, he already foresaw the spread of political propaganda. He felt it was melting more closely into sociological propaganda and becoming more and more pervasive. The reason for this was the rise of mass media. Propaganda society is essentially a mass media society. Mass media define the style of democracy, Elul says. And in this way, they slowly but surely destroy democracy. Constant election campaigns as a permanent media spectacle produce pathological individuals in a pathological society. What Elul wrote more than 60 years ago about the self-destruction of democracy sounds as if he was describing the current presidential race in the US. He said, we have seen that the existence of two contradictory propagandas is no solution at all, as it in no way leads to a democratic situation. The individual is not a supreme arbiter when he decides in favor of the more honest and convincing candidate. The individual is seized, manipulated, attacked from every side. The combatants of two propaganda systems do not fight each other, but try to capture him. As a result, the individual suffers the most profound psychological influences and distortions. Man, modified in this fashion, demands simple solutions, catchwords, a clear and simple division into good and evil. He cannot bear ambiguity. He cannot bear that the opponent should in any way whatever represent what is right or good. In the end, propaganda democracy undermines itself and produces totalitarian man. Elul says the means employed to spread democratic ideas make the citizen psychologically a totalitarian man. The only difference between him and a Nazi is that he is a totalitarian man with democratic convictions. Well, after these a bit dramatic French theorists, let's move on to a more dreary German thinker, Niklas Luhmann. Luhmann actually has nothing against elections, but he doesn't believe that there is much truth to the common assumption that they express the will of the people. Luhmann's election theory needs to be understood in the context of his theory of politics, which in turn needs to be understood in the context of his theory of society. But outlining this would take too long. So I just say two basic things. First, for Luhmann, society is not a sum of individuals, but consists of social systems, which fulfill various social functions. 
This is similar to a view of the human body, not as a collection of individual parts like arms, legs and a head on top, but rather as a complex organism consisting of a lot of subsystems, such as the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, the immune system, and so forth, none of which is in charge of the whole. Like bodies, society too is not controlled or guided by any particular system. Instead, it evolves organically. Second, and accordingly, for Luhmann, the function of the political system is not to steer or micromanage all of society, but to make commonly binding decisions. Take for instance abortion. Politics can make a general decision on the right to choose, but still the legal system must make concrete laws regulating this choice, and they differ from place to place and time to time. And moreover, if someone chooses an abortion or not does not just depend on politics and the law but also on the, their economic situation, on medical options, on their religious beliefs, on the personal relationships they're in, and so forth. All these factors constantly influence one another and they change all the time. Political decisions do matter, but they exist in the context of many other decisions that can matter just as much or more. In this context, Luhmann argues against a mainstream conception of elections. The mainstream idea assumes that the point of elections is to find out what the will of the people is. An election makes the people the foundation of all political power. After the elections, politicians, with the help of the state, put the will of the people into practice. At least that's the idea. They are the servants of the people. But according to Luhmann, in reality it's not like this. Instead of being the source of all power, in a liberal democracy, the people function as the audience of politics. Like in a talent show, they get to elect, at a certain predetermined time in the show, a winner. But the show as a whole is a much bigger system, where producers, performers and the audience all play their parts and influence one another. The audience is as much serving the producers and the performers as it is served by them. Similarly, in democratic politics, the state, the politicians and the voters all mutually serve one another and together they serve the system, not the other way around. For Luhmann, elections are symbolic procedures. They bless politics with the mythical will of the people. But in reality, there is no such thing as the people and their unified will. In an election, a lot of people abstain and many can't vote in the first place. For instance, because of their age. What's more, the election result is determined by quite arbitrary rules. In the US, for instance, the majority of the popular vote does not count as the will of the people. And in Germany, the government is usually formed by a coalition of parties, a coalition that not a single voter actually voted for. There is no coalition on the ballot. Elections are, for Luhmann, a throw of the dice, a game of chance with arbitrary rules. The winner is decided by innumerable factors that the participants cannot control, and to a large extent, they aren't even conscious of them. With a nice pun that unfortunately doesn't work that well in English, Luhmann states that the public opinion, öffentliche Meinung, that is supposedly expressed in an election has little to do with what people opine or meinen or think. What the individuals actually think, if anything at all, when they mark ballots, remains unknown. This alone suffices not to conceive of public opinion as the general expression of the opinions of individuals. What people have in mind when they vote is neither knowable nor even relevant for the election result. An election, Luhmann says, presupposes the people as a kind of superior instance within which the miracle of melting the individual will into the general will takes place. Elections are magical. 
They produce the symbolic foundation of liberal democracy, the will of the people. This fiction is in turn grounded in the fiction that marking a ballot expresses individual sovereignty. But, as mentioned, while Luhmann has zero belief in these fictions, he also has no problem with them either. The miracle of the democratic election is just fine, as long as it functions okay for everyone involved, and I tend to agree with his view. At the time and at the place where Luhmann lived, that's post-war Western Germany, democracy was functioning all right, at least more or less. So why not vote? It can be fun and exciting, after all, like a game of dice. The question is if the same can be said about the USA today. To address these questions, I'd like to ask first, what are the functions of elections today? I suggest there are several. First, elections legitimize the political system. To use another expression by Luhmann, they produce legitimacy through procedure, legitimation durch Verfahren. No matter the result of the throw of the dice, no matter how many percent of the vote which candidate gets, the total number of votes is always 100%. The political system itself always wins by 100% to zero. This is why political propaganda so loudly insists that no matter who you vote for, the most important thing is that you vote. Every voter votes first and foremost for the election. De Boer expressed the widespread suspicion that elections present false choices. This is not just to say that often there is no big difference between candidates. It's also to say that if there was a real choice, people might choose something other than what they are offered. And this is true now in the US. On October 22, a mere two weeks before the election, and after massive propaganda campaigns about the supposedly monumental choice between candidates, a majority of US voters still dislike each candidate more than they like them. They wouldn't choose either. But in the end, a winner will have been chosen. A real choice will have taken place. That's a second function of an election, transforming a false choice into a real one. De Boer also said that an election makes voters part of a process that is never questioned. This is a third function of the election. It exonerates propaganda by making the people responsible for the result. After all, it was them who decided the winner. They got what they asked for. Although in many elections the majority of the population does not vote for the winner, the winner is always their choice. If they don't like the outcome, they have only to blame themselves, but not the political process. The arguably most important function of the election is, fourth, the identification with the civil religion behind political power. In the past, political power was typically believed to be grounded in not really existing divine will. Today it is believed to be grounded in the equally not existing will of the people. In the past, politics was coupled with religion. Today it's coupled with civil religion. Jacques Ellul wrote, the creation of a religion is one of the indispensable elements of propaganda. The content of this religion is of little importance. What matters is to satisfy the religious feelings of the masses. These feelings are used to integrate the masses into the national collective. We must not delude ourselves when one speaks to us of massive democracy and democratic participation. These are only veiled terms that mean religion. Participation and anonymity have always been characteristics of religious societies and only of religious societies. The civil religion that people participate in and anonymously celebrate in today's elections is the Enlightenment master narrative, the neoliberal story of individual agency and of the freedom of will, of choice and of autonomy. In reality, though, 
everyone knows, an election like the one in the US now is a profiling contest between huge political machines funded and supported by huge capital, political and military interests. There is little authenticity in the candidates or in how the votes for them are produced. In reality, each candidate and each vote is part of a political spectacle. Campaigns are second-order observation processes where candidates and voters constantly poll and observe how their political identities are seen by others. The American election is an almost global social evaluation feedback loop where people become truly invested in the political identities shaped by the campaigns. Are you for Trump or for Harris? That's what political propaganda does today. It offers profile choices. You pick one for yourself. But the different political campaigns join one sociological propaganda effort. Each candidate represents a different denomination of the common civil religious faith. Trump is the embodiment of its right-wing version, a Jordan Peterson, Elon Musk-style manifestation of the self-made strong individual. Harris is the lowest common denominator of everything woke. She represents an identity politics supposedly empowering everyone to be who they are. Okay, now I want each of you to tell your own name. Do that. <laughs> Because it's about all of us. It's about all of us. Together, in Ilwell's words, they satisfy the religious feelings of the masses and integrate them into the national collective. This brings us to the final question. What to do on election day? Can't we still say, as Luhmann did, even if we don't believe in the neoliberal religion, it's still good to have it. It provides meaning in life. It works just fine for most people. I'm not so sure, though, that it does, given all the current socioeconomic problems, and in particular, the increasing inequality and democratic decline in the US, which actually both candidates openly address. Trump and Harris accuse one another of being a threat to democracy. I suppose they are both right. U.S. democracy seems to be in a downward spiral. It has become increasingly self-destructive. As it's obvious to many people, the current culture wars only produce losers. This means to support either candidate is to support the decline of American democracy. But you can, of course, choose which type of decline you prefer. There are at least three good reasons not to vote. First, a sort of personal hygiene. As Elul says, in an election in propaganda society, the individual is seized, manipulated, attacked from every side. The combatants of two propaganda systems do not fight each other but try to capture him. Not voting is a strategy to avoid such capture and, as far as possible, to protect one's sanity. The second reason is solidarity. Solidarity with all those deeply affected by American politics, but excluded from the election. I mean, people subjected to American direct or indirect warfare all over the world, from Vietnam to Iraq to Palestine, never had a vote. And I mean, millions of migrants in the US who have no vote either. They don't count when the will of the people is counted. Voting in a US election is a bit of a neo-colonial thing. It means, at least implicitly, to feel entitled on grounds of being American, to make commonly binding decisions on the fate of others who are not. The third reason is political. Embrace a new form of extra-parliamentary opposition, or for the German viewers, a new apple. A revolutionary movement for voting abstinence and election sobriety. Non-voters should demand that their voice, or rather their silence, is heard. They should demand election reform. If a majority of Americans dislike both Harris and Trump, neither of them should be president. 
If neither of them gets more votes than the total number of non-votes, the election should be declared invalid and a new set of candidates should replace them. Or as to a parliamentary system like in Germany, if let's say 30% of eligible voters don't vote, 30% of the parliamentary seats should remain empty. Therefore, my dear American viewers, think twice if you really want to vote on November 5. Stay sane and fix your democracy. Okay. Here, I really wanted this to be not so political. I wanted it to be more theoretical. You know, uh, it's not about any of the two candidates. It's really about the theory about what's wrong with the situation right now. And a lot of people say you are not a political scientist, but you are a philosopher and you did just that uh, philosophizing. I hope people see it that way. Yeah. <laughs>